Well, welcome to this video. The subject we're looking at today uh, is the complications of immobility. Now, mobility is the ability to move around freely and at will. So immobility is any interference with the ability to move around freely and at will. And it's important to realise that immobility can refer to all of the body, whole body immobility, or it can refer to part of the body, part of the body immobility. But before we actually start looking at the, the content, uh, there's one thing I want to point out about nursing. And that is that a lot of good nursing is invisible. You can't actually see it. Because a patient comes into hospital, maybe has an operation, gets better, goes home, and everything's okay. There's no complications. And what the nurses have been doing, very often, is not obvious. But in fact, the nurses have been doing a lot of things that have been preventing complications. So nurses need to know in detail about all the complications that can occur to their patients. And what we're looking at today is really complications, the complications of immobility. So nurses need to know about these complications. And because nurses know about them, they account for them. And because the nurses account for them, these complications hopefully never occur. And if the complications never occur, it means the patients never even know never even knew that these complications existed. They remain in blissful ignorance of these complications. So very often it looks like nurses have not been doing very much, but in actual fact, by interventions, they've been preventing these complications occurring. Not very good for the ego of nurses, but it's an important point that a lot of good nursing is invisible because we're preventing these things happening. So hazard of immobility, Let's start off by looking at uh, some possible causes of immobility fairly briefly. We're not going to do this in detail, but causes of immobility first. What causes immobility? Well, this is any condition, any condition at all, whether traumatic or pathological, in which movement is restricted. So movement might be restricted in a simple case of something having a fractured arm and a cast on it, to being completely comatose and utterly immobile in every way. So as we said, whole body immobility or part body immobility, whether caused by disease or whether caused by trauma. So for example, devices can cause immobility. We used to keep patients on traction for huge periods of time. We tend not to do that very, very much these days. We tend to use external fixations for fractures, but you know, various devices um, ventilators, things like that, can restrict patient's movement. Now, another cause of immobility is um, impairment of neuromuscular function. Whenever the nervous system or the muscles are not working properly, there's going to be immobility. For example, if the spinal trauma and there's a transverse, uh, transverse damage to the spinal cord, then the no, no impulses from the top of the spinal cord can get to the bottom, so the lower part of the body can be immobilised. And this can also happen in a number of disease processes, such as uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or uh, muscular dystrophy, or mycena, mycenia gravis, or motor neuron disease. Many diseases can affect the nervous system and the musculature, therefore movement is not going to be possible. So devices, neuromuscular function, and voluntary immobility, imposed bed rest, but not very often used these days. <clears throat> now, if you go back to, say, the 1920s, 1930s, bed rest was imposed for virtually every condition. But then they found out uh, in the Second World War, when soldiers were often severely injured, but they were rehabilitated fairly quickly and not left lying around for weeks and months, that they actually got better much quickly, much more quickly. So starting from after the Second World War, patients were immobilized for shorter periods of time and they found out that that improved the prognosis, that they actually got better quickly if the patients were not immobilized. So changing from bed rest being the treatment for almost everything, now bed rest is the treatment for some things, but not very many. Now the emphasis is very much on early rehabilitation, early mobilisation. 
even after someone's had, say, a myoca myocardial infarction, then mobilisation tends to occur fairly early. We'll sit them out of bed the day after and start mobilising maybe the day after that. So um, <coughs> mobilisation is measured in days, remobilisation is measured in days, not weeks and months. We do still arrest some conditions, for example, spinal injuries, conditions where there's inflammation or acute illness. Of course, the patient needs to rest. But very often, early mobilisation is, is, is the order of treatment, and we do this to prevent the complications of immobility. For example, after surgery, I mean, basically, we get the patients up as early as we can, as early as they can tolerate it, because it gets them moving around and it makes these complications less likely to occur. So I think, to try and condense what I've said, the rule of thumb is only keep patients immobilised if you've got a good rationale for doing so. That might be a, a fairly good rule of thumb. So voluntary immobilisation, use if there's a reason to, for example, if there's an inflammatory condition or the patient's acutely ill, or you have another good rationale for doing so. Of course, part body immobilisation might occur to allow a fracture or a tendon to heal. But normally, mobilisation is the, is the treatment of choice. And finally, psychiatric causes. People may become immobile because they're uh, in a depressive stupor or they're too depressed to want to get out of bed. Or in simple schizophrenia where they don't have the motivation or the volition to get out of bed. Or in other rare conditions such as catatonic schizophrenia, which is characterised by periods of immobility. So various causes of immobility.